Hi everyone, welcome to the Photoshop Show. Tonight we have an amazing show for you because we have somebody who's staying up very, very late to join us, Mr. Glenn Dewis. <laughs> Yay! Right. Yay! How you doing? <laughs> if you've been on uh, Google Plus at all, or you've been on the internet, or you're not sort of dead, then you probably know of Glenn Dewis. <laughs> he is everywhere doing his amazing Photoshop and Lightroom tutorials, and we're so excited to have him tonight. He's also a pretty funny guy. So I think you're going to have fun with him. Oh, and <laughs> Glenn is going to introduce himself to you in just a moment. But just to give you a little preview, we have a really heavy hitter panel tonight, all of whom <laughs> have been our special guests um, in their own right, including Miss Erica Thornton. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Photoshop Show. Tonight we have right, an someone is playing there. Because we have somebody who's staying up very, very late to join us, Mr. Hang Glenn on. Dewis. Yay! Is, is somebody Hi, playing back there? Um, check your if browser. If you've been on uh, Google Plus at all, or you've been on the internet, or you're not sort of dead, then you probably I mean, know. Of, you have it playing in the background. Everywhere, doing his amazing Photoshop and Lightroom tutorials, and we're so excited Thank to have him. Somebody is playing. He's a funny guy. So I think you're going to have fun with him. And Yay! Yeah. Who was it? it? It was Glenn's fault. The new kid. <laughs> Glenn it did the it. New kid. Okay, sorry, Jan. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, I was just going to say, and then I'm going to have all these people introduce themselves, that on our panel we have Erica Thornis, we have Sean Duggan, and we have Jean McCullough, and of course we have co-host Ron Clifford. So I hope that all those people will now tell you what they've been up to in the last couple of weeks and a little bit about where we can find them online. Starting with, let's see, how about Sean Duggan? Okay, uh, well, thanks for having me. It's always fun to come back and join you guys with the Hangout. Um, let's see, the last couple of weeks I have been, uh, my new course on lynda.com was published this last week on creative video compositing in, with Photoshop. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Um, so that was that's pretty cool. Um, and then in two weeks, I'm heading off to Reykjavik, Iceland, to do a couple of uh, day-long seminars for the local photography and design community in Reykjavik on Lightroom and Photoshop. And after that, I'm going to hang out and try to find some auroras to photograph. How exciting. And listen, will you please um, get back with me about a date when you can come and show us that technique that you demonstrate in your lynda.com course, which is amazingly yeah. cool. Yes, I know. We do have to set a date for that, and we shall. Okay, that would be great. And basically, c can you say in a nutshell what it is, just a teaser? Well, uh, there is uh, there's a lot of video editing functionality in Photoshop, which a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, and what I focus on more is doing video compositing, so compositing different video clips together or video and stills together uh, using all the techniques that you may already know from Photoshop, layers, layer masks, blending modes, all those can be used to create really interesting video composites. So we start with some fairly simple projects and kind of work our way up to get a little bit more complex and cool and involved. So a lot of fun stuff. Oh, it's so amazing. It looks like nothing I've seen um, anybody else even showing, let alone explaining or teaching how to do. You know, these still images, like an example, correct me if I'm wrong, but an example of this beautiful photograph in Iceland, and everything is a still photograph except for the moving water, for example. Right. Okay. Yeah. There, there, there's a few things that I've done with moving water and creating some kind of virtual locations and things like that. So there's a lot of cool projects in that course. Neat. All right, well, we'll see you back for that um, for hopefully in a month. Yeah, excellent. And so thank you for joining us in the panel. I'm sure you'll have great questions for Glenn Dewis. And we also have in the panel Jean McCullough, who's been a guest before. Hi, Jean. Hey, Jan, how are you? Good. What you been up to? Well, uh, working on LightroomSecrets.com, as usual. And uh, recently had an article come out in Lightroom Magazine. That's that uh, online, that e-magazine for the iPad. And I believe, Sean, you just had one come out in the last edition, too. Uh, it's on the slideshow module, so if you're interested to find out how you can get more power out of the slideshow module, pop on over to your iPad and look for Lightroom Magazine. Cool. So I have a question about that. When mm -hmm. would you use a slideshow in Lightroom? What, is it an exportable slideshow, or is it just something that you have to have someone standing behind you at your computer to see? No, you can export it to a video if you wanted to. Uh, 
the the problem with slideshow module is that it's very limited. They haven't given it a lot of love yet. Uh, but the upside is is that it's there in Lightroom. So uh, a lot of wedding photographers that I talk to will throw pictures into that slideshow module and be able to project, you know, just the basic shots from the day, you know, right out of it while they're, you know, capturing more images. Makes sense. Great. And we also have with us Erica Thornis. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm here down in San Diego, and I've just been enjoying our weather, which has been rather warm. And this past weekend, I went out to the desert, and um, I practiced some of the techniques I learned last week when we had the um, the astrophotographers on of um, Carrie Ann and Daryl. So I've been practicing and showing those on my page on Facebook and on Google Plus, and um, I'm the only Erica Thornis, so you can find me. <laughs> So it's kind of I, saw, I saw those photos. You did a great job of taking photographs at night with silhouettes in front of beautiful stars that just, you know, colors. It was really nice. It was fun. It was a fun experiment. I, I'm learning a lot from it. So this show has definitely inspired me more than once. Cool. And, Ron, do you want to say hello? And then we'll have Glenn introduce himself. Yeah. Hi. Um, really, really excited to uh, this is such a great panel tonight. I mean, it's like, it's a, I can't. Anyway, I'm all, I'm all flustered because everybody's so talented here. It's just incredible. Um, I do want to uh, shout out. I have invited my. I'm doing a layers, masks, and modes little mini workshop online, and I've encouraged them all to tune in tonight because um, if they want to learn from a master, then Glenn is certainly the person to watch. So, um, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, that's great, Ron. We'll, we'll look for that. And then, Glenn, we're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for staying up so late because you live where? Can't hear you because you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> no. so, there you hear me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I'm based uh, in Oxford in the UK. Um, and just hearing that about the weather then in San Diego, man, I wish we had some of that over here. I'm not going to do the typical Englishman and complain about the weather, but it has been bad. So, you know, be gentle tonight, all right? <laughs> but, and tell uh, us something I mean, about you. Um, okay. Um, photographer and retoucher. I think I'm mainly known for uh, the kind of stuff that I'm doing in Photoshop, but, you know, that all comes hand in hand with the photography. Um, I do, I would suggest that maybe... Blimey, 75% of what I'm doing now has gone down the kind of the, the teaching route, the training route. That seems, just seems to have naturally happened that I moved over into that a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm doing quite a lot of one-to-ones. We've just launched another workshop uh, series which starts today, or well, it's been launched today anyway. Um, and I'm really kind of grateful that doing what I'm doing allows me to travel quite a lot. So had I not been doing this, in fact, before I even started doing this, I wasn't the most traveled person, but... Thankfully now, you know, getting out there and teaching Photoshop and the photography has enabled me to go all kinds of places like uh, like the US, which I keep trying to stay in, but they keep kicking me back out again. Oh, uh, well, listen, we all want to come over there, you know. Everybody hey, we wants can do a house swap. I'm more than happy to do a house swap. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we got to sign you up for a Texas tour, Glenn. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, I'm all, I'm all for that, big time. Yeah, big now, time. Now, what, what is, Oxford is where the university is, I assume. So, yeah, right? Oxford's where all the posh people live. Um, <laughs> With <laughs> well, you, <I'm>, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? I love speaking to you guys because you always say, oh, I love the way you speak. Over here, I sound so common and just normal. <laughs> but you guys think I'm normal. So that's why I love speaking to you guys. Um, but yeah, Oxford is, um, it's, it's, I suppose it's somewhere that most people would have heard of if they think of the UK. You've got London, Oxford. Everyone's heard of the Oxford and Cambridge boat race, you know, it's, it's kind of like a famous place, but it's um, it's a very, very old, uh, beautiful place with the, kind of the old cobbled streets and the old buildings that date back hundreds of years, uh, big university town, so it's a real kind of uh, trendy kind of place to, to go to. It's a lovely place, you know, it really has got some great scenery there, so it's a nice place to be around. Cool. So tell me, did you always, did, did you start out as a photographer or do you have an alter ego? Uh, you're something else behind the scenes. Um, no, I, I never never started out, never intended to be a, a photographer either. I just kind of slipped into it because I, I, when people ask me this, I always sort of tell them the story about um, when I was growing up, I had an uncle. I think everybody's got 
that member of the family that's always got the camera in their hand and they're always shoving it in the you know family members' faces and you kind of hated at the time. Um, but he, my uncle Dave, was always the family photographer. I never ever thought I'd get involved in it. And then I kind of like moved away from home. I was living in London. I was kind of working in a, a bit of a secret squirrel job, working for the government in London. Um, and then the one time I sort of I did go back home. My uncle was there. And he was in the kitchen with his laptop, and he said, "Oh, Glenn, come and look at this here." And he showed me this piece of software um, where he m removed red eye off a photo, and he sort of clicked it, and I was hooked. That was it from then. And uh, the fact that he'd been taking photos for about forty years and still getting red eye, I didn't say a word about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I, I kind of got hooked. I think I've got a bit of a, an addictive personality. I really liked it, um, and I just kind of just went with it and that was it and things have just kind of naturally moved on that way and now you know this is this is what I do so uh, feel very very lucky love doing this and it's, uh, it's great fun it's good fun doing stuff like this you can't you can't complain can you it's great oh it's amazing I can't believe it's a job you know hey. but so Ed so what do you you're, you're just self-employed you're doing everything on your own is that right yeah there's um, the business that I have is it's it's me mainly uh, my wife in the background doing all kind of like the bookkeeping and stuff like that because that's what she used to be a bookkeeper uh, and you may have heard I'm sure you would have heard if you haven't you have been sleeping under a rock somewhere uh, Dave Clayton he's my uh, he's my best friend and is also uh, my assistant and he's the guy that what he does behind the scenes helps me to kind of look better than I really am he's a, he's a great guy and he's uh, he's a designer guy he's just like a multi-talented kind of guy that you want to have around he's great fun oh gosh I wish I had someone like that do you do does he do the production of your videos or do you do that no do you know that's that's kind of something that that I do I've um, I do I mean we talked earlier on about having little sleep I do generally have just maybe four hours sleep a night sometimes um, I'll do all this kind of I'll do all this stuff I'll do all the video editing myself um, I, I just love doing that. You know, it's not a chore. I actually do really enjoy it. And since we've had all the, you know, all the sort of creative cloud has thrown everything into the pot, I'm I'm probably like you guys. I'm using much more than I ever thought I would do. I mean, today was the first day that I used Adobe Audition, and oh my god, absolutely superb, absolutely superb. So yeah, I, I, I do all that, and it's just, just part of what I do. So. That's really cool. I mean, it is interesting that those of us who used to say, oh, I'm a photographer, then we became photographers and teachers. Now we're photographers, teachers, and video professionals yeah, 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 <laughs> and yeah. publishers and everything else in the world. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. But I, I can't, when you sort of say, you know, if a, if a lay person says to me, what do you do, it's easier to say, uh, I'm a photographer. Because if you say you're a retoucher, it kind of draws all kinds of like, what the heck is that? Um, and you have to explain it. You say, "Oh, I do airbrushing, you know, Photoshop." Oh, right, yeah. Now I know what you mean. My brother's got that, and it doesn't seem so important. If you <laughs> say that you're a, if you're a photographer, it kind of sounds better. But I, I always, I suppose, I'm kind of fifty-fifty, um, or fifty-one forty-nine. More, more Photoshop, I guess. I kind of fluff my way around the photography, really. Between us, don't tell anybody else. But I kind of fluff my way around. <laughs> Well, that's really cool. And what are you doing when you come to the States? Have you been talking at conferences and stuff? Yeah, yeah I've been uh, very lucky. I've been um, uh, teaching at Photoshop World, which is something that I've was kind of like in my bucket list uh, of things that I wanted to do. It's kind of weird, but um, I, my first one I taught there was at the beginning, I think it was December 2012, um, uh, Washington 2012. And I got the phone call from Scott Kelby completely out of the blue. And uh, he kind of rang me up because we, again, I'm grateful that we became kind of friends, just you know, long distance friends over the time. He'd come to London, we'd hung out a few times, and then completely out of the blue, he rang me, and uh, I, I was in Oxford, um, I was having a coffee, I was in Costa, and uh, he ring, phone rings, I didn't recognise the number, and he says, uh, "Hi, Glenn, Scott," and I'm like, "Hi." That'll says, give you a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, he said, "I'm just here having lunch with uh, Calabria," and he said, "I just want to ask you a question." He said. Um, you're going to Photoshop World, right? I went, yeah. He said, will you do me a favor? He said, uh, will you teach for us at Photoshop World? And I was like, trying to be cool, but I went, um, <laughs> I said, yeah, bear with me a second. And I put the phone to my chest and I went, wow. You know, <laughs> beep, 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 beep. I went, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. I was like, oh my God, you know. So, yeah, yeah. that was what I discovered I was bilingual then. I didn't realize I knew so many expletives. 
But I kind of, um, yeah, that's, I, I'm now teaching the furniture world. I mean, look, I've been invited back. I'm back there again in um, April. Um, before then, I'm going up to the Netherlands. I'm doing some stuff over there with Frank Dorhoff. Um, and then, you know, later on, I'm doing something. I've got a phone call today, actually, full enough. I've been invited to teach over in Fuerteventura for 10 days. Uh, which are big sort of like a community I never even knew about, this big photography training community that have invited me to go and be one of the trainers over there for 10 days. So, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to get some sun. I've got to go. I, I want to go from blue to white, and then I can go <laughs> and as well. You can relate. <laughs> that's so wonderful. I'm so glad that's happening for you. It's really exciting, and you totally deserve it, because not only are your tutorials really um, educational and useful, but they're fun to watch, and I think that's really the secret. You know, so much of this stuff is difficult and could be technically, you know, just put you to sleep, right? And you do it in a fun way, so I appreciate that. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, and <laughs> shortly you will come and entertain us with a fun bunch of tutorials. Um, but before that, a couple of announcements, and uh, maybe I'll do a short thing and show you something too. Um, there has been, uh, there are two big things this week. One is, I don't know if you guys noticed that Adobe is back to offering Photoshop and Lightroom through Creative Cloud for only $9.99 a month. And, yay! <laughs> And I understand that's for anybody, like you don't have to have owned previous versions. So this is a great opportunity for everybody to jump on it. You know, it's going to be, it's, it's the best deal ever. I'd go for it. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So that's out there. And as usual, they say it's a limited time offer. They tend to keep, you know, redoing it and redoing it, but it's still <laughs> limited time, so get on it. So it's a rolling limited time. <laughs> right, right. That's thing number one. Thing number two, I'm so excited. I think I can say this um, on the air because um, the person involved has announced it online, and that is that John Knack, of, who has been working at Adobe for 14 years, holding amazing uh, important positions like I think he was principal or, or senior product manager for Photoshop for a long time and then uh, principal product manager for digital video and other things as well. He is moving from Adobe to guess where? Do, do, do. You could say it. Steal the thunder. Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google, Google, it's true. To Google, um, do Google's digital photography team. Oh my gosh, that is really exciting. You know, at first I'm like, oh no, don't leave Adobe. But then I'm like, oh yay, do go to Google. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, whenever we see John Knack, he'll be wearing Google Glass. Oh yeah. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's happening. Um, so we're, I'm sure we're going to find uh, all new exciting things happening for photographers on Google after he gets settled in that job. So that's all happening. Now, uh, what else? Oh, so and for me, I've, you know, nothing happens for a long time and then everything happens. Right, guys? That happens for you too, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, I am writing a classroom in a book all by myself um, about Photoshop and Lightroom. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty big, and it's, you know, I miss writing. I haven't done it in a while, um, but I really enjoy writing, so I'm doing that. And then next week, I go to the lynda.com studio the uh, um, to do a course about using Lightroom with Photoshop Elements, which is something that, um, you know, maybe a lot of people aren't doing, but I get requests all the time when I teach live from folks who don't want to buy Photoshop. What else can they do? They need a pixel editor to go along with Lightroom. And one solution is to use Elements, which goes for as low as like $59 or something. And you know, Jen, invariably, as when I do my, my stuff, I almost always have one or two students that are using Elements. And so this is something, one of the big questions is, can I use Lightroom with Elements? So and that's Elements a great course. Is free. If you buy it with like a printer or with you know your Wacom yeah. tablet, um, Elements is usually free. So that's why a lot of people have it and have access to it. Yes, yeah, so I think that will help people out. I already did a course on there about using Lightroom with Photoshop, and now this is Lightroom with Photoshop Elements, and that will expand that bunch of information. So that's all happening for me this week, but right now I'm very excited about what we're doing here, um, and so I thought I would just take this opportunity to do a short tutorial, just because I want to show off for Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> and also <laughs> because I have not done one in so long on the show I apologize but I've been really busy so I wanted to show you something that I think may come up for you and that is um, 
what happens if you have your camera set to shoot not only RAW, which I hope most of you are shooting now, but also JPEG? Um, many digital SLRs can do that. Are you shooting both at the same time? And it comes to mind that one example of a time when you might want to do that is what Jean was talking about. When you plan to make a quick slideshow. For example, you're shooting at a wedding and you want the bride to be able to quickly see, um, you know, do a slideshow of everything and you don't want to sit there correcting the raw files. And you know, raw files don't always look great at first because they're just the default interpretation of data into pixels. So anyway, you might want to have a bunch of JPEGs for that purpose, but not sacrifice having the raw files to work with later. So you say you've done that, you've shot both, and then you're in Lightroom and you no longer need the JPEGs anymore. The wedding is over and they're just hogging space on your drive. What can you do? So that's what I wanted to show you real quick. Um, the solution that I came up with to deal with that. And I already told those guys they can't make me look bad and say, no, that's wrong. There's a better way to do it. <laughs> but you can actually if, if you know something. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, or try to. Can someone tell a joke while I do this? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell I never, a joke. I never remember them all. <laughs> my music. All right, now let's see. Now you might see my screen. Do you? It's about to happen. There's always that lag. There it is. Yay. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom 5, and we are looking at a whole bunch of photos that I did not take. My partner, John Lorenz, shot these photos, and um, he never does what I say. He always does the opposite, you know, right? Right, Erica? Are you guys what? there? Hello? I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm just always worried that there's going to be some sort of loud noise, so I always have my mic, my mic on mute. Oh, okay, fine. Well, Erica probably knows guys never do what you say, and so John always does the opposite. And so I'm like, John, don't shoot RAW and JPEG. And he does anyway, right? And then he's so kind that he lets me import them into my Lightroom catalog and use them in tutorials and stuff. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, here I have in this catalog both RAW files and JPEGs. And how do I know that? Well, for one thing, you can see, can you guys read above the thumbnails? Each thumbnail has the name of a file followed by RAF, which is the raw proprietary raw format for the Fuji camera that he has, the X, I think it's X100, and then it says JPEG right after it. Can you read that? Hello, panel. Well, I can't, but I but my I turned my my thing down, so I can read it. Okay, yeah, good. I'll, I'll so that's that's how you would know if you were in that situation that you had both kinds of files, and that they were both uh, you know Lightroom could see them or see at least recognize that both were there. But so at this point I'm like okay I don't want those JPEGs anymore. I want to get rid of them off my hard drive, and I can't just go out to my hard drive and get rid of them because they're all intermingled by file name you know in my operating system's file list, and it would take a long time to have to select each one individually you know, or all together and, you know, by clicking on them. So here's what I'm going to do instead. First of all, by default, Lightroom does not treat the JPEG separately from the RAWs, as you can see. So what I need to do is kind of tear them apart from inside of Lightroom. Well, where's the command for doing that? Anybody there know a command to do that? I don't. No, I don't. I don't either. So here is what I'm going to try to do instead. I'm going to go up to Lightroom's preferences and on the Mac that's under Lightroom, on the PC under Edit, and go down to Preferences, and go to the General Preferences. And there is an option to treat JPEG files next to RAW files as separate photos. Well, that sounds like it might work, right? Let's try that. So I'm going to check that, and then I'll close the Preferences. Well, nothing happened yet. What I need to do now is basically import those JPEGs separately into the catalog. I could do that by um, using, you know, just doing an import, or another way to do the same thing is to right-click the folder that contains all of these files in the Folders panel in Lightroom and choose Synchronize Folder. And in the Synchronize dialog box, I could leave Show Import Dialog before importing unchecked. I'm just going to leave it checked because I want you to see what's going on here. So then I'll click Synchronize. <coughs> And that opens the big import window nah, 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 with nothing in it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, and now you can see in the import window, each fo each photograph for each thumbnail has a neighbor. The neighbor is dimmed out. The neighbor is the the raw file that's already in the catalog and therefore appears dimmed out in the import window because Lightroom doesn't want to have duplicates of what is already in there. But the JPEG of each photo is lit up, checkmarked, and ready to be imported. So this is how I'm going to get these JPEGs to be in Lightroom as separate entities is by going ahead and clicking import here or if I had uh, chosen not to show the import window I would just let synchronize run. Same thing. So we click import and now we see all the JPEGs coming in and when we have previous import selected in the catalog panel we see only the JPEGs in the library. But if I were to go back as I probably would if I were working here to the folder that contains all the photos. Now I've got another kind of a mess, which is I've got each raw file and right next to it the corresponding JPEG. Well, great. I said what I wanted to do is get rid of all the JPEGs and now I have to look at them all mixed in in Lightroom. What would you do? Anybody ideas what to do now to just get my hands on the JPEGs here so I can delete them? I would filter for just the JPEGs. Yeah. Right. Filter for the JPEGs. That would be one way. But you know, some people might even go for just go down to the sort menu at the bottom of the library and sort by file type. And then at least, you know, you could get all the JPEGs in a pile here and all the raw files in a pile. But I like what Sean said because it's just nice and neat and we'll be able to see just the JPEGs. If you press the backslash key on the keyboard, and that opens the filter bar at the top of the library and from here I'll click on the metadata filter which really is such a um, powerful filter that I fear that a lot of people don't use often enough mm -hmm. now here in any one of these columns I can click the uh, the title of the column and choose to have that column represent file types and now I see in the file type column of the metadata filters that I have 48 JPEGs and 48 RAWs and if I choose to see only the JPEGs by clicking clicking on JPEG, there they are. Even if I make my thumbnails smaller by dragging the thumbnail slider in the toolbar to the left, all of these files are just JPEGs. Now I just select them all, Command A or Control A on the PC, and hit the Delete or Backspace key on the keyboard. And I'm going to actually delete these from my disk because I don't want them. Now if you're afraid to do that, what you could do instead of this is select them all, and make a new folder and drag them into the new folder in the folders panel. You could do that. And then, you know, you could remove them from the catalog without deleting them from the disk. But I'm going to go ahead and choose delete from disk so they don't show up because I said I don't want them and I really don't. If you and only now, don't be scared. I still have the raw files. When I go back to file type. Where'd they I, go? There they are. <laughs> I go back and click on all file types and there are the raw files backslash again to close the filter and now I have just the raw files. Yay! Yay. <laughs> one, one little tip there for you Jan, when you have that original setup where you saw that the uh, the raw plus JPEG was on your your description for the file type because it was treating them as you know, not separately. Yeah. If you, if you want to get to the JPEG you can always right click on any raw and say show in Finder or show in Explorer and typically all your JPEGs will be right after your RAWs because they'll have the same beginning file name. Ooh, that's a good idea. But see then Gene, when you get out there to do it, I see two problems. Number one, as you say, every JPEG is right after the RAW. So you have, you know, if you have thousands of photos, you're not going to pick out, pick them out one well, by one. If you just want to get to one JPEG. I mean, oh no, I was saying I want to get yeah. rid of all the JPEGs. Yes, that, right. that would be Yes. Um, the other thing is even if you were to delete, delete the JPEGs from the um, operating system, I think, I'm, I haven't tried this, but I'm guessing that Lightroom would say, you know, there's these missing files because you didn't tell Lightroom you deleted them. I haven't tried that. Oh, yeah, I wasn't saying about deleting them. I was just picking up on the fact that if you were working in that, in that workflow where you kept your JPEGs, but you didn't want them in the catalog, but you needed to get to a JPEG, you could just do the right click. That's absolutely true. Thank you for adding that. Okay, so I'm done and now I have to figure out how to bring myself back into... Oh. Yeah. I was going to say, Sean, that is the most realistic glove puppet I've ever seen in my life. 
<laughs> <That's the other laughs> wow, look at that. That is so realistic. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't have any really good Photoshop tips to show tonight, so I figured I'd just show a cute dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a winner. It's always a winner. Taking the easy way out. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what I always say: cute always wins over creativity. So. <laughs> Why I do so well. <laughs> well, look, you know, Glenn has been sitting there so patiently, and I know the many people who are watching the show are waiting to see him. So Glenn, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna embarrass Glenn here a little bit because. I'll tell a short story. Whenever I'm watching his stuff on my iPad, I have the volume down, and my wife says, why is Christopher Eccleston teaching Lightroom? Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so cool. I love your wife. <laughs> <laughs> but then she looks over and sees you. But <laughs> oh, and then she, oh, you had to ruin it, didn't you? you yes, I did. <laughs> that's really mean. He's cute. What do you mean? Listen, I have to tell you, Glenn, th there's a certain generation where any guy from England, like immediately you had nine, nine or ten points. Like you could be the grossest looking guy in the world. If you have an English accent, we love you. And you know why? Why? So the Beatles. Oh, right, okay. I'm glad you said could have been the most grossest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. All right, take it, take it over, Glenn. Wow us. Right, so I, I'm going to do a, a screen share. This is what Ron, Ron taught me well, hopefully. All right, let's just go for a screen share, and I'll go for that one. Start screen share, and then I'll dive over to Photoshop. So can you guys let me know what you can see on the screen? Right now, it's still blank. There's, there we go. I've got it. Have you got Iron, uh, Man. Iron Man? Okay. All right. Well, um, the first one, the first thing I'll, I think I'll show. We'll start off nice and quick. Um, this is a pitch that I did. It was a, obviously it's a composite. It doesn't exist. Well, it does in my head, but not for real. Um, this is a guy over in the UK who actually makes these suits, believe it or not. He does them for the uh, the film premieres. Um, and he's a car mechanic by trade, but he makes these things. This is what it's like originally, after I've done a, a few little bits in it. But the one thing I want to show you, you probably notice on the on the body armor, when I'd uh, researched this, because there was going to be all kinds of debris and dust and that kind of stuff flying around, it didn't seem right that his body armor was going to be perfectly intact, so I needed to make it look as if it was dented. And, you know, Photoshop being Photoshop, there are countless ways that we could do that. I mean, you could probably do, like, dodging and burning if you were really, really good at it to make it look and appear as if there was dents in it, particularly this one here just on the uh, the side of his chest here. Um, but the technique that I actually used for this, I did do a video on, on my YouTube channel, and all it was doing was was using um, finding on the internet, going to Google uh, Google's photos, we've mentioned already, um, and finding pictures of cars that already had dents in them. And you can use those original dents and put them into the picture to make it look as if like Iron Man was dented here. So that kind of got me thinking about another thing we could use that same technique for. And I used it on this picture here. Now, I haven't applied it just yet, but this is a, this is a friend of mine called Steve Cook. He's, I think he's number two now in the world at his um, body weight for kickboxing. And he's only about five foot nothing, but I, wouldn't, I would never, ever tell him, you know, that he was small, because he, he hard as now as this guy. But what I wanted to show you was how we can use the same technique now to give him more abdominals, because he assures me when he's in fight condition, he's got good abs. So because this was a picture, this was, and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to dispute that because he's hard. So I wanted to sort of, when I retouched this picture for him, I wanted to give him abs like he told me he had. Okay. So the way we can do that is I'm going to go to uh, the hard drive here, and I've got a picture of a friend of mine called uh, Nigel. This is Nigel here. I mean, this guy is a genetic freak, uh, lovely guy, um, and he's already got the apps. So, um, Gene, I borrowed this picture of yours. I hope you don't mind. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I can now get my lasso tool. I'm just going to make a very rough selection of Nigel's abdominals like that. Then I'm just going to get my move tool, and I'm going to drag those over into this picture here. Obviously, they're a little bit big at the moment, so we can just resize them, bring it down just a little bit, and just place them somewhere roughly where they should be. Now, the only thing you have to be careful of when you do this is to kind of line up the navel. So let's just lower the opacity down just a bit, and we'll just line up something like that. 
and then that's it. Bring up the opacity a bit more. So, so maybe something like that's looking good, and I'll just press enter to put it set into place. And we can always change that later on. So because we're going to be good, you know, nowadays we work non-destructively as much as we can. The next thing I'm going to do is go to filter, and I'm going to convert that layer for smart filters. Then I'm going to go to filter over and use the high pass. And I'll take it right down at the minute, something like that. And the great thing is now, what I can do is I can use this radius here to bring up, to decide how good his abs actually do look. All right? So I can bring it up. So that's probably uh, about me now. I, I wish. Those days are long gone. Uh, so I can bring up the radius slider, keep bringing it up across to around about here. So that's looking good. And then click OK and change the blend mode now to maybe something like overlay. So we can kind of like bring it in. So now I can turn it on and off, and we can give him abs. I can also maybe kind of mask it out a little bit, which is on his trousers. Get a brush, get a black brush, 100% opacity, and just paint it off this kind of area just around about here. So it's only going to be on his main abdominals. And the great thing is, because we're using smart objects, we can always double click on the high pass there to bring it up to say, well, we don't want it quite so much, so we can bring it down. Or we could even bring it up even more to show the abs off a little bit more as well. So that's just a, a quick one. I just wish that when they see, it actually looks better from the distance as well. They can see he's got his nice abs on. So you can mask out areas as well. So it's a really quick way of uh, adding the abdominals in. And that's exactly what I did on the Iron Man. Just getting pictures of cars with uh, dents on them, making a rough selection of the dent, dragging it on top of him, and doing exactly the same thing, using that high pass. And the great thing with the dents, you can actually decide how dented you want it to look by how far up you bring that radius slider. So that's just one of them. Obviously, you guys don't need the abs one anyway. So uh, we'll just close that one down. So okay, I have a question. Go so for it. This is a great technique, and it works great on the boxer, and it's cool with the dents. How do you think of uh, situations in which you can use a technique like that? What goes through your mind to say, oh, a boxer, oh, Iron Man? Um, obviously, it just it, it does depend. Um, what I would use that on. I mean, I do a lot of work with guys who are, um, and girls who are physique athletes, and that's predominantly because that's what I used to do. I used to compete in bodybuilding, so I'm kind of naturally drawn to uh, working with people who've got physique. So I'll always um, use it, but I've got to be honest with you, a lot of times that I have used it, that's probably one of the only times that I've really pushed it on bare skin. A lot of the times I'll tend to use it when they've got like a tight t-shirt on um, just to make it sort of stand out more through their through their t-shirt. There was a picture I did, which I might show in a short while. It was um, a guy who's a, a rugby player, an English rugby guy, and he wasn't really in condition. Um, but he had, I mean, the rugby guys now in the UK, they wear these really tight t-shirts because obviously they're playing professionally now. They're in much better shape than they used to be years ago, so they are looking quite muscular. But when I photographed him for this particular shot, he wasn't really in the best condition. And he was really paranoid about his teammates seeing the picture without him looking, you know, muscly. Um, so I used that technique on, because uh, he was like a three-quarter shot, uh, and I used it to sort of add back muscles onto him as well. So it looked like his back was a bit more knobbly. It's very vain, all this uh, physique stuff, isn't it? But uh, people require it, so I will uh, tend to use it. But the one on the Ironman, Jan, that was just purely... Um, I came up with it just by playing around, but it was a technique that I just thought that just worked for me, it just worked best. It would be a really good technique, I'm thinking, for aging paper or aging like boxes if you were doing something. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of stuff you could do with it. I know that um, when I kind of first started out, I did a picture, a couple of pictures, where there was a guy who was punching the ground and the, the ground had cracked, and I used a really kind of Blimey, a really basic technique to get a crack off the road which I'd photographed with my phone to then put into this picture. I think if I'd use this technique now, if I could like rewind time, I think this technique would probably work even better for it. But um, see, this is this is the great thing. This is what I love about Photoshop. You know, we get we get taught so many different techniques, but I've always kind of thought, I don't know what you guys think, but I've always thought that the skill in Photoshop and also Lightroom, it's not knowing lots and lots of techniques. The skill is knowing when to use them. 
because um, you know crumbs if everybody was you know if everyone kind of remembered and used the word techniques they saw in the magazines everybody would be doing this for a living and everybody would be producing just amazing pieces of work but it's how to combine all the techniques together to get the final result I don't know what you guys think Oh, yeah, I, I totally it's... agree. That's why I asked you that. What were you going to say, Gene? Sorry. I was just saying it's also uh, good to know as as you get through this when to back off on some of these. I mean, you. Yeah. I see a lot of people they'll put these these techniques and these effects on, and they just go way overboard, and then yeah. wonder why they don't get the same results that someone like you gets. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I was always told from um, from the start. In fact, one of the the best things I ever got advice I ever got was to slow down um, to just do a little bit and then go away and come back to it because I think nowadays with so many places that we can share our pictures you know like the revamped um, Flickr we've got um, 500px and all these other you know great places that show your pictures off really really well There's, there can be a tendency once you've done a photo shoot to just rush your way through it and get it online but you know, once you've got it online, it's been seen, and that's it. And if you notice something you didn't like, it's like, ah, do you know what I mean? You've kind of like oh, yeah. done too soon. And I've, I did that before with a, a picture of a, I did of a guy who was, was a soldier, and he was like a, like an Afghan kind of scene where he's walking away along this dirt track, and I'd photographed him with two rim lights, and I'd originally started the photo shoot as a three-quarter length shot, so it worked great because you didn't see the floor. Um, so I worked on that, but because I get, I generally do get very excited when I'm doing all this kind of stuff. I really do get into it. So I thought, hey, why don't we do some full length shots? So I've kind of like moved back, and I'm taking pictures of him at full, uh, full length, not thinking to turn one of the rim lights off. So when it came to doing the retouching, I was completely blind to the fact that I had shadows, two lots of shadows crossing each other on the floor. So I've retouched the picture. Uh, composite and I put it online and I was getting loads of great feedback as you do on Flickr and loads of people hugging you and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden one person says how many sons were there in your picture <laughs> and I'm like what does he mean I think oh no just tell them it's sci-fi you're on Tatooine or something yeah yeah it's not real. it's not meant to be but it was it was meant to look real <laughs> so I couldn't even pull that one I couldn't even say yeah I know I know um, so I had to kind of then uh, you know, use the technique to get rid of the shadow, but it already been posted online, so I can't remove that one now. But in my portfolio, the one that I would want to have done had I not rushed is in there. Um, but hey, that's just the way it go. But yeah, biggest advice, or best advice I was ever given was to slow down. What else you got? Okay, so let's just close this one down. I've got a real, really simple one here. And that's not that's an Nigel. Really simple one here. This was a, again, it's just a composite. This is one I did when I was doing a workshop over in uh, Germany, and this guy, he travels the world basically doing, um, is, a, is a double for Johnny Depp, and he's generally, whenever you see the Johnny Depp coming out the front of the, um, the sort of cinema, it's generally this guy, Johnny Depp scarpered off in a car at the back, so this guy's, you know, he's a bit of a stuntman. Um, but the only thing I was going to show you, I've got a real thing about, there's a couple of things in Photoshop that I've got a real um, kind of fetish over. One of them is selections, I love working out ways to do selections uh, mm. and another one is lighting effects and I've got a couple of lighting effects which I want to show you tonight and this is just a really really simple one because like I said this is a composite I wanted this to look as if he had this kind of um, you know the, the really olden days when they had those torches when they put the flames and they were kind of like on metal rings and it was shining down that's the effect that I wanted to create here and it's a really really simple one and it's a te technique that I've used Many, many times, and maybe you guys have you know used this one as well. Um, I just want to quickly show you how you do it. Let's just cancel that. Um, to add this kind of light source, I'm going to go to layer, uh, new fill layer, and gradient. I won't bother calling it a name because I can be lazy. Uh, gradient comes up, and when we've got the gradient fill box here, we can click on the gradient itself and choose another gradient from within the gradient editor. It doesn't really matter which one we choose because we can always edit it by these little points here but to start me off on a good footing I'm going to go for this one here so it's already looking quite nice but what I also <laughs> want to do is just change this purple to a coolish kind of blue so go down here because what my Johnny Depp uh, Captain Jack Sparrow he's in this kind of cave here where the lights can be nice and warm on one side but as it goes further into the cave and further past him it's going to go cooler 
So let's just drag that down to something like that, and we'll click OK, click OK there. And then I can use this angle here to decide what kind of direction I want the light source coming in from. So I'm going to say something like that, and then click OK. Doesn't look realistic at the minute, but I'll then come over and change the blend mode. I love blend modes, like I guess we all do. And then click on soft light. So it kind of gets you somewhere near there, but if you want to finesse it, we can just double click on it, move this out of the way, and then put your, bring your cursor on top of your picture. Let's just turn these little notifications off. Who hates Mavericks? As I do. <laughs> Let's just go up to there and turn those off. There we go. So now that I'm actually in the got the gradient fill box up here, I can bring my cursor into my picture, and in real time I can click and drag the light source to where I want it to be. So something like that. Click OK. I could even lower the opacity down. I actually use the fill. So you can go from making something looking you know, OK, pretty flat, to a very very quick editable way of adding in a light source. And I tend to do that a lot. There's a picture I did of a, a guy who was, um, you've heard of the program Mad Men, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, this guy was wearing a trilby hat, and he's smoking a cigar, and I put, a, like, a brick wall behind him, but I wanted it to appear as if he had a street light above him, exactly the same technique. And going back to what we said earlier on about being a photographer, that's when the photography comes in, because none of this would make sense if he didn't already have highlights on him as well. So there's no point doing all these effects if you haven't actually got the lighting correct as well. So I quite like that one. I use I tend to use that one quite a lot. Have you got? I take it you guys have seen that one before, or I, I've seen the gradient, but that dragging inside of the image is a good tip. I didn't realize you could do that. All right, cool. Okay, yeah, it's quite. It's nice to be able to see it in real time, isn't it? Rather than just sort of like having to keep guessing and clicking and whatever. So I quite like that one. All right, okay, so. Moving on then, let's just get rid of Captain Jack. Um, and I want to show you this thing here. Now, I'm not, and probably never will be, a landscape photographer. Okay, That is a skill way beyond me, and I can just about take pictures at work for my backgrounds. But when it comes to taking landscapes, it, it's a big no-no for me. But I do like kind of taking them to play around and experiment with uh, lighting effects. Uh, and like I said to you, one of the things I really like in Photoshop is selections, lighting effects, and in particular shadows. Because the original shot here, this is actually one I took this morning, and it was absolutely freezing uh, when I took it. But this is just like an old barn, and I wanted to try and make it look as if it was a different time of day. But you know, although we can make all these different color effects and changes, particularly in, in Lightroom now, you guys can, who are really, really specialized in Lightroom can do amazing things by changing the coloring and stuff. But Regardless of the colouring, you've still got to have shadows to kind of give it that added um, added effect. So I want to just quickly show you how I do this. And this is um, a tutorial that I'm actually going to be having in a, my weekly podcast, which goes out uh, every Wednesday now. That goes out tomorrow. What should I say today over here? It uh, goes out tomorrow. But I want to give you guys a preview of it anyway, of how I would do this shadow. So rather than doing it on this one, because there's a few little intricate things on that picture there, uh, what we'll do is we'll go to this picture here, just to show you it closer up to give you an idea of how you do it. So when I'm going to change uh, the colouring in a picture, maybe uh, give it like a bit of a feeling of having a sunset, one thing I'll always do is add the shadow at the very, very start, because we want that shadow to take on the colouring effect that we add in later on. I think if I add it at the very, very end, if I add the shadows at the end, it just isn't going to fit right. And like everything in retouching, it's always those small things that make the big difference. So for me, when it comes to doing the shadows, I'll always do them at the start. And I'm just going to use something like a levels adjustment to do that. Now, you might think, not you in particular, but generally, people might think that to darken it down, well, we could just simply just grab maybe something like the mid-tone slider and drag that across to the right-hand side. And yeah, sure enough, it, it darkens the image down, but there is a side effect to it. Because if I now zoom in, and if I just turn, if I can hold down this little uh, button here and press it off and on, off and on, you can see that although the picture's darkened, which is kind of like the start of me wanting to create this shadow, the side effect of what I, what I don't want here is that the, by using the mid-tone slider, it's also increased the saturation in the brickwork and in the grass. And you can see that, like I say, when I turn it on and off. So using that particular method isn't going to work for me. So let's just reset it. And I'll just double click on the hand tool to go back a bit and just zoom out a bit. 
So what I'm going to do to darken this down to create a realistic kind of shadow is actually use the gradient underneath here. We've got the black and the white points with the output levels. So I'm going to drag the white point and drag that in towards the middle. So now we can see that the picture does in fact start to darken down, but there is no change in like the saturation. It's more of a natural, pleasing and, and realistic kind of look to it. So I can bring it down so far. And obviously, I don't have to get it spot on right now. I can always come back and change it because we're using an adjustment layer. So it's always, again, working this non-destructive way. So now that I've done that, obviously the whole pitch is darkened down, which I don't want. I want to invert it first of all. We've got our keyboard shortcuts, Command or Control I, or we can just go to Image, Adjustments, and Invert. Then I'm going to get a brush. And I'm going to make sure that the brush is actually a hard, 100% hardness on the brush. And I'm going to paint in white, so my foreground color is white. And let's just zoom in. So I'm going to imagine that the light source that we're going to add in later on is going to be on the horizon, just on the kind of like, you know, where we've got the line of the building. It's just at the back of there. So it's going to be hitting this wall, and the shadow is going to be coming straight down, or maybe just up at a little bit of an angle. So the first thing I'll do then, with this brush at 100% opacity, I'm going to put a little dab just there. And let's just make sure there's no settings on this brush. Let's turn off the shapes. There we go. So a little dab at the bottom. I'm going to hold down my Shift key, and I'm going to think that maybe the shadow is going to go off just slightly at an angle. So now I'm going to hold down my Shift key and click. And that's going to give me a nice straight line. It saves me trying to be really accurate. So I can just do it nice and quick like that. So we'll zoom out, and now, now that I've kind of like defined where that shadow is going to be, I can be really sloppy and just come in really quick and paint it over this part of the wall. So we'll just cover that in, like so. And I will go really quickly here. Just I might go over the edges of the bricks just a little bit, so don't you sitting there twiddling your thumbs while I'm trying to get really accurate. So let's just go across to here and into there. In fact, that's just typical Virgo. I've got to do it properly. Here we go. Let's just do that. Tidy that just a little bit. So you get the idea that we don't want to have it anywhere other than on that wall there. Oops. Right, so that kind of would work now. You can see if I turn that on and off, it's a fairly pleasing effect so far. Um, and having this hard line here, to some degree, that, that could probably work if we weren't doing this on grass. If this was on a concrete floor, a road or whatever, the line would be pretty much straight like that, but this is grass. So how do we create the effect that the actual shadow is hitting grass? Well, there's a couple of things we can do. I'm going to get a brush again, and the great thing is we don't need to go and install any special brushes or anything like that. We can use ones that are in their default when we first get Photoshop. So I'm going to come over to here, drop down, and if I remember rightly, it's number 134. That's like three blades of grass. So I'm going to click on that. Then I'm going to go to my brush presets here, and I'm just going to change some settings. So we can see in the bottom the preview of what the brush is going to look like. First thing I'm going to do is just change the angle of it. I don't want it to be completely upright. I need it to just be angled off slightly, because I'm going to paint down this line here that we've got. So I'll angle it off just a little bit. Shape dynamics, I don't really want to bother with that, so I'll turn that off. Scattering, yeah, I'll keep the scattering. Definitely don't want color dynamics, don't need that. And transfer, no, we won't bother with that. But what I will do is just increase the spacing a little bit. So now then, I'm going to come out of here and come to this line. And you can see the shape that we've got, which is this one here. I'm going to decrease the size of it with my brush. Uh, left bracket key, I apologize. And I'm going to do is I'm going to paint down here. So as I paint down, I'm going to occasionally increase and decrease the size of the brush, just painting down like this. And you're painting on the mask, right? I'm painting on the mask, yeah, because what we originally had was a very, very straight line, which we don't want. And all we're looking to do here, you've probably heard Joel Grimes say it, it's sell the fake, all right? So now the effect that we've done there, if I just hold down my alter option key and click on the layer mask, you can see what that's actually done. So rather than having a dead straight line, it's given me this kind of fake blade of grass effect. So now that... Um, shadow is actually looking like it's hitting the grass. So that's one thing you can do, but you can take it another step. 
Um, but first, before we do that, I'm just going to maybe just very, very quickly just change the color in. Lots of ways we can do it. I'm going to go to something like a selective color. By default, when we open that up, it says reds, but we'll just change it to neutrals, and we'll just play around with some of the sliders here just to warm it up a little bit. I'm just going to really rush through adding in the color in just something like this. We could even maybe go to a photo filter, choose something like 81 and bring the density up, something like that, just to sort of give it a little bit of warmth. So what I want to do now then is do something with this grass here because the shadow's looking all right but you know this is this is the thing when um, I did on the, I did a video today all about this and, and on there I said one tip if I was asked to sort of state one tip that would help people with retouching that tip would be to just get out and observe just look around you especially I mean today we actually did have some sunlight and it's a case of, right, just get out with your camera or your, your, your mobile phone and take pictures of things that are around you. Not because you want to take a great picture, but because you want reference pictures. So take pictures of shadows, take pictures of reflections, take pictures of all kinds of things. Because, I mean, you guys, you know, you do compositing. How many times have you had people ask you, how do you draw a shadow? What does it look like? How do you do this? How do you do that? I think if only you'd taken the time to actually study what really does happen with shadows and light, I think it can make your retouching a whole lot easier. I mentioned in the video today about a friend of mine, Aaron Blaze, who's the, the he used to work for Disney, he does amazing drawings of elephants and lions and all that kind of stuff. But whenever he's doing a drawing, he doesn't just draw it by memory. He always has reference pictures with him. And that's what I'll always suggest to people, get out, take reference pictures, and then you'll be able to see what needs to be done, how to paint in shadows, and all the little things that make the big difference. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So what I'm going to do now, just a little thing, and this, again, it's only a small thing, but on this uh, area of grass here, I'm going to give it a little bit more impact. Because if we had a sunset, that light would be skipping over this grass, and it would make that grass really quite stand out. It would be a lot sharper and a lot clearer and more defined. So we can kind of fake that. So, uh, in fact, no, before we do that, here, let me just jump back. See, I do this. I do jump around quite a bit. Right, this uh, layer mask here. Whoops. Yeah, the layer mask here with all the grass on. One little thing mentioning about doing observing. When you have a shadow, um, wherever it hits the building, the shadow is always very defined and sharp. But the further away the shadow becomes it gets softer and softer and softer. So what we can do is get something like uh, the blur tool, which you find in amongst the sharpen and smudge tool. Let's put the strength up to 100. And what I would do with that is just increase it. And I'd, at the bottom here, I'd paint a couple of strokes with the 100. Then I'd change the, the strength of it to maybe something like 60. Go further up and paint a little bit with that. Change it to maybe something like 30. And a little bit of something like that. So at the top, it's nice and sharp. And as we go further down, it gets softer and softer and softer. So that's just one little thing. Um, okay, so getting back then just quickly, let's talk this little thing we said about the grass here. What I'm going to do, again, being a good boy and being um, working non-destructively, I'm going to shift click so that all my layers are selected here and go to the fly out menu at the top of the layers panel and convert to smart objects. And Photoshop will do a little bit of thinking. Hopefully it won't take too long. Uh, and what it's going to do is put all these layers there into a smart object, which is like those kind of like those Russian dolls that you get when you put one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other. The layers are still there, but they're neatly packed away, which for a Virgo is very, very appealing. Um, so now we're going to go to Filter, and we're going to go to Camera Raw. And this is the great thing. I, I, I remember watching a uh, previous episode, Jam, when you had Jack Davis on, and uh, I think it was probably when Camera Raw had just been given out as a an available filter and you said to Jack that at the time you were kind of like intrigued as to why we would want it. Um, I'm guessing that's probably changed now to be honest with your attitude or your thoughts of why it is because I, I mean one of the biggest things for me with the, the updates with Creative Cloud and it has been getting uh, Camera Raw as a filter because now what we can have is access to everything within here at any point during the retouch and that, and that is a godsend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my adjustment brush and I'm going to make sure all the sliders are at zero here. Apart from clarity, I'm going to bring up and sharpness I'm going to bring up. And I'm going to click on the show mask at the bottom. And all I'm going to do is just paint 
over. Uh, let's just um, hold on. Let's see, play. Not something's happened here. There we go. Just paint over the grass like so. Obviously, if I go too far over, I'll just click on erase. And we'll just paint it off this little bit of grass in shadow because that grass there is going to be very, very dull, no sharpness to it whatsoever because it's in shadow. Let's just turn off the mask. And then all I'm going to do, you might not see it on the screen, but this is certainly one that if you do it on your own pictures, you'll definitely see the difference. Increase the sharpness here. And what that's going to do is that's going to make that grass just stand out just that much, much more so that you know it's got that kind of feel as if the light is skipping across it from behind. So Hopefully you can see that, but if not, take my word for it. I wouldn't lie to you. It's uh, making that grass just that little bit sharper, like it would be in real life if uh, if that light was skipping across it. So would you to ever finish worry off, about, oh sorry, Since, would you ever worry about the tufts of grass that are standing up taller and do any dark shadow underneath those? Yeah, you could come in um, with. I mean, this picture here. I wouldn't really use this one because this kind of grass here wouldn't suit. But you could actually use that um, three-pronged uh, blade of grass brush head that we have there to paint some in uh, underneath here. Um, or you could do, there's also a single blade that you could actually do, but I think something this close, I wouldn't want to do it, to be honest with you, because it wouldn't look that good. Well, this is just roughly to show you how you can do that effect, which I did on that final picture that you saw with the barn, where it was all kind of uh, a little bit more into it. It's wonderful. It's helped me a lot. <laughs> Uh, oh, good. <laughs> um, the next thing I'll do here is I'm going to use the temperature just to give it a bit more warmth. And we'll just get a gradient, sorry, radial gradient here and just a radial filter. Don't want any clarity, but I'll just give it a little bit of a vignette. Let's take the sharpening out. And just bring that down as well. Just going very, very quick. Click OK. And again, this is just to show you the, the kind of process that you can go through to to add in shadows. I've got a real fetish about shadows as you've probably gathered because um, they can completely transform a location, they really can. Um, hey, Glenn, is this the picture you were doing a composite on with the two soldiers earlier today? Actually yeah you're right mate, um, this yeah, is okay. one this this got this actual, um, I don't know what they call these, this is a World War II kind of bunker I suppose where they would have been in, two guys would have been in so I've got one guy in the uh, composite, he was sat here, I had a camera on a tripod uh, and I've taken a photo of him there. We had a little crisp packet, and then he's moved across to the other side of the crisp packet and changed his position and changed his hat so it looked like two people. But yeah, I've, I'm kind of worked on that. That's a work in progress because my original thoughts have kind of changed, but it's a personal project, so there's no no kind of rush there. Oh, that was the same guy. I didn't even realize that looking Yeah. Right. Do you know what? I, I, actually, cause I actually posted, I said... Uh, Great photo shoot today with Barry and his twin brother Barry, <laughs> and uh, and one guy just commented going, huh, "How funny! His mom made, named them both Barry." I'm like, well, "No, it was, <laughs> it was a really bad attempt at a joke." But hey, there you go. Um, the last, <laughs> the last thing. Let's just add a, a very very quick uh, blank layer. Let's just try and make a a down and dirty um, a sunset of uh, the sunlight. So I've got a blank layer, I'm going to get a brush, I'm not going to use the blade of grass brush this time, uh, I'll just use a nice soft edge brush, um, we can make it fairly big, go to my foreground colour and I'm going to choose a kind of nice orangey yellow kind of colour, something around about that there would be fine, yeah, I'm going to go for there, click OK and then I'll increase the brush size and I'll just dab, let's make sure we've got no settings in there, that's one thing I always forget, shape dynamics, and we'll put a little dab on there. It doesn't look realistic at the minute, but we come over, and my favorite of all blend modes is Color Dodge. We'll use Color Dodge, and then that can be used to kind of just add in just that little bit of sunlight coming through. And we can then use our Move tool to reposition it where we want. But what I really like about that is how a little bit of that light would skip around onto the wall. And you can turn that on and off and see how it just skips onto the wall. But another great thing is we've got these blades of grass here that have got that almost blown out white in them anyway, but when we add this colour dodge layer over the top, it blows them out even more, which adds to the kind of realistic effect, if you like, of what sunlight would do. So that's just, I mean, that's just like a... <laughs> I've got a round of applause. <laughs> oh, way with you. Um, so that's just a very, very quick run-through of 
you know, it's not the best picture to show it on, but it kind of shows it up nice and close. Uh, and that's the kind of things that I did on this picture here, just to change it from a very cold day uh, to make it look as if it is in San Diego and we've got this nice heat going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, just one little thing about that as well, which one thing I mentioned on the, the video for tomorrow was the fact that you'll notice for this particular shot, I was waiting for ages when it wasn't raining, but the clouds were filling the sky so that we get no obvious shadows on the ground. And that's one thing I'll always say, if ever you're going to be taking photos for composites, try and get out on a day when it's you know a, a cloud-covered sky so that you can then decide where the clouds are going, to, sorry, where the shadows are going to be later on rather than like Mother Nature dictating to you how your picture must look. You can decide later on. And that makes the photography side uh, of your models in the studio easier because you then haven't got to think, well, I've got to photograph them with this particular light source because that's what the shadows are like in my background. Take it when there aren't any shadows and then the world's your oyster. Yeah, I have to say, I, um, I don't do much with composites myself. I mean, I do, but I don't do a lot. But I, I, I do a lot of landscapes and do a lot of fine art interpretation. And just that uh, color dodge technique, I just saw it save me hours of work, uh -huh. of hand painting. I mean, it, it uh, great tip. It's amazing how much, you know, you think you just, you get to a, a, a certain point, you think you know enough about what you're doing, and then somebody just changes everything for you. So that was one for me. Well, th this, is what I, this is what I love about Photoshop, Ron, is that, you never ever stop learning, or at least you never should stop learning. Do you know what I mean? I, I could go to go and sit in on one of your classes, and if you told me one thing that I didn't know or I didn't think about, that would make the trip over completely worth it. I could go to Photoshop World, and although I'm teaching out there, I'll sit in classes, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's, it's just been, it's made it all worthwhile. Oh, completely. Yeah, 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 I mean, one thing we we've learned doing this show is that this just continu continuously happens, not just for us, but the panelists and the guests and people in the, the, the chat all have these aha moments when something that, that might seem very simple to the person doing the instructing is revolutionary to the person watching. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, I had somebody, um, I think I posted a, well, I did, I did a video last week, and you know that little thing where you, you can, um, you put a little, paintbrush dab and then you hold a shift key and click some distance away and it creates a straight line. Out of the whole technique, the, the, the whole video, this one guy commented saying, you've made my day. I never knew you could do that with a shift key and a brush stroke. I'm thinking, yeah, what about the technique? You know, I mean, I spent ages doing that. <laughs> that's one thing really made it for him. But that's the way it is, isn't it? It can be something really simple or something that we take for granted because we're always diving into Photoshop and doing things really quickly without giving it a thought. But for somebody else, it can be a game changer, a complete game changer. I mean, that, that color dodge, uh, Ron, that was exactly how I did the glowing light on his, uh, on his body armor here. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. And it just works. It's my favorite, favorite blend mode. I love it. It's so adaptable and got so many uses for it. I love it. Yeah, Fantastic. I agree. Fantastic. What about you, Sean? You do a lot of compositing. Do you use some of these techniques too? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I, I have to say that I totally agree with what Glenn said about if you're out photographing for a composite, you know, photograph on an overcast day or an open shade because you can always, as he said, you can always add shadows in far easier than you can remove shadows yeah. that are already in the in the shot. So. Mm -hmm. Overcast lighting is my favorite for shooting elements that I'm going to be using in composite. It's just so so much more flexible and easy to work with. Now, Glenn, when you you talked about setting up the shoot in front of the bunker, so that doesn't sound like spontaneous shooting. It sounds like you had kind of planned out something in advance. Is that your general approach? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> that's something I've, I have always done. I always like to... Um, plan and prepare and get the most of my time and that that goes back to when I first started that you know when we're when we're of working Monday to Friday we've got a full-time job and we've got a weekend and we want to get out shooting but then we've got a you know our partners to think about that we can't then go and disappear away for the weekend we've got to spend some time with them as well you know we've got to um, make what time we do have shooting we've got to make it count so when I first started that wasn't the case for me I'd I'd get really excited about booking a photo shoot and I'd 
I think I'd planned it, but I'd get there and I'd work with a model who kind of expected me to tell them how to pose. And after about five minutes, we'd just run out of ideas. And I'd booked a studio for four hours and I had to pay for four hours. So this kind of like pointless exercise that I had, while well, I was coming away very, feeling very deflated, the way I turned it around was thinking, right, I'm going to treat every single shoot I do, even if it's not a paid shoot, every personal project that I do, and I do a lot of those because it's, I think that's what the only thing that's really made me grow is by forcing myself to do personal projects. I treat those as if they're commissioned shoots. So I will, um, I'll book a time in the diary, I'll source locations, I'll source props, I'll get the right model, I'll go on to places like Imp Awards and uh, Apple movie trailers to get ideas and inspirations for pictures, and I'll plan it, and when the day comes, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing, and so does the model, and it just works. Glenn, do you find yourself also going around and collecting different backgrounds, just like you would collect textures for some other composite down the yeah, road? Yeah, I, I do, mate. Yeah, I, I definitely do that, and uh, I'd, I'd recommend you know everybody do that because it doesn't cost us a penny, does it, to collect them? Right. Um, I used to use uh, stock websites like uh, you know iStock and stuff like that, but the popularity of using stock photography has just grown incredibly and unfortunately so has the price. <laughs> so I would end up getting a what I thought would be a perfect background, I'd pay for it and I'd then put it into my picture and it didn't work and I'd kind of wasted well what would end up being like 20 pounds now. It's like my god I kind of keep doing this. So now that I've um, plan and prepare it, I generally kind of know what I want to get the background. I don't, I mean, I don't go out purposely thinking today I'm going to go and photograph backgrounds. I generally kind of capture elements, if you like, you know, backgrounds and textures and stuff when I'm out doing a shoot anyway. I'll kind of get the best of both worlds and two bites of the cherry by actually doing the photo shoot and getting extra bits as well. And you mentioned quickly, um, I couldn't really understand what you said. Some places you go for inspiration for ideas. Um, All right, yeah. Slide sharing. There's a uh, let's just write it down. There's a website which I absolutely love. Uh, let's just I'll give you a, a bit of a. Uh, I'll write it down because it'll be easier. Let's put it onto pixels here. Okay. Isn't it yeah. amazing? You can use Photoshop like Word, also, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's just wait that to open. I'll get T, get D, T, and bring that down a bit. It's a website called, um, my god that's big, uh, Imp Awards, which is I-M-P Awards, let's just bring that across, dot com. So Imp, Imp Awards dot com. Uh, and what that is, that's, I mean I use that site all the time, it's basically a site that has, um, my god, any kind of, any movie, think of a movie, I guarantee that the um, movie art, the posters that they created for it, they'll all be there for it. So you'll have pictures from movies of past, present and future. And they don't just show one poster, they show all kinds of different posters that were created for it. And although I look at that, I don't do it in order to completely copy the picture, but I'll look at them and think, I like the way they've done this, I like the way they've done that, and I collect those as references again. You know, going back to what we talked about a short while ago about getting reference pictures. Um, and I'll store them and I'll keep them and I'll think, how did they do that? In fact, oh, that would look good there. And I'll try and replicate it. But without having those reference points, I wouldn't maybe think about it. So it's a great way of doing it. And I watch a lot of movie trailers as well, like the Apple movies. Uh, you've got Apple movie trailers, which is a great one. Um, YouTube as well. You've got loads of footage on there for movie trailers. And I watch a lot of those because it gives me... Uh, an idea of colouring and all that kind of stuff to give pictures a certain look. Yeah, some of this reminds me, well, we had uh, John Paul Caponegro on the show a couple of times, and one thing that he really advocates is, is um, keeping a pad around and, and um, drawing his ideas and writing his ideas. Yeah. And that helps them um, actually come to fruition, even when he's not thinking. Like you say, you bring your camera, you're not necessarily going out to shoot a sunrise or a yeah. bunch of clouds, but because you're aware of the projects you have on the go, the assignments that you've self-assigned, you're able to be productive yeah. even when you're being leisure. T totally agree with you. I've got a, um, a moleskin, um, a little black sort of A5 size book 
um, which I keep a couple of pencils with as well. I mean, I've got an iPad, but I always tend to find that I'm quicker to write it down and draw it in there than I am on my iPad. So that's with me all the time because my my brain, it kind of worries me sometimes. I come up with ideas at the most bizarre times and I'll just sketch them down. And I, I mean, I could open that little book now and there will be about maybe a dozen or so pictures that I've badly drawn that will give me an idea of things that I want to do. I mean, I'm working on some projects at the minute involving... Uh, wildlife, elephants, and stuff like that, and I've I've thought of things. If I don't draw them, I won't I won't get them done. I'll forget about them. Um, and now I, it's exciting because I look through that little book and I think, God, I've got so many personal projects to work on, and that just excites the hell out of me. It strikes me that you are not just a photographer. Of course, you're also an artist, a designer, um, and and that y there are elements of. Um, Things you might learn in art school as a painter, for example, like about shadows and about light. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it really involves way more than what we think of as traditional photography. It's great. You no, know, I can't, I can't, I mean, it's, it's great that you say the word artist, Jan, but I kind of struggle with that word for me. Everyone I mean, does, everyone does. I, I kind of feel that, well, I just do what I do, and sometimes you feel like you kind of fluff your way through it. But, you know, all I do is I will look at what, um, what is there? What what I actually see with my own eyes? I'll take a picture of it. I mean, the prime example was I did the the picture of the girls, um, a friend of mine's daughters. I created that picture of them uh, when they were like looking into the or stood by a wardrobe with the light on, and it's yes. kind of inspired by the the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe film that I loved as a kid, and it was, I wanted to do something like that, um, but I didn't know how the shadow would look hitting the wardrobe, which I would then draw in later. So all I did was I took a picture of, I got a little mag light and I, sh I shone it onto the wardrobe because this was all miniature stuff and I took a picture of it with the shadow and then I knew how to draw it in. So, you know, it, it wasn't clever. It wasn't me being like a, you know, this kind of like amazing artist. I'm just copying what I saw. But if I hadn't taken that picture and had a reference, I wouldn't have a clue where to start. So it's, it's easy. It kind of makes me look cleverer than I am, I guess. It's just, it's just I mean, you've got to have reference points. Right. Well, I don't think you give yourself enough credit. I've seen many pe people who call themselves painters. That's what they do in their, what's it called, plein air painting, where you're, sta you're standing in front of the scene and painting what you see. So you're painting with, with pixels what you see. Don't forget to add magician, too. Yes. I mean, yeah. is, isn't, that, isn't that like a shoebox, that room? Yeah, that was a, um, it was, it was a little sort of, um, sh uh, a cardboard box that I um, I went to I went online then I was looking at a doll's house shop and the floor is paper it's like a paper print of um, flooring the, the wallpaper is a roll of paper a little A4 roll of paper and the uh, the wardrobe's about as big as my hand um, and those the toys are the girls original toys that I put into there as well and the great thing is they've now got this it's on the way to them being printed and it's about four and a half foot wide on metal and wow. it just looks absolutely I just love it I really love it I'm big time into getting things printed it's just amazing I love it yeah, that's a good thing you mentioned Glenn a lot of people have forgotten that that there's something different about a piece when you're done or even just a a regular photograph if you can hold it in your hand tangibly yeah, yeah. It's completely different, isn't it? I mean, you guys know that if you, I presume, you know, I, I'm guessing here you've all got your iPads and stuff like that. You'll have your pictures on it, and then you might show somebody um, your portfolio on an iPad, and the, the very nature of what they are, people flick, flick, flick from one picture to the next, and they go, oh, that's nice, flick. Well, that's quite, I like that one, flick. But when you give them a print, it's a totally different experience. They kind of like hold it at arm's length looking at it, they bring it closer, they move it around to the light, they kind of walk around going, oh I like that, look at this. They spend so much time, more time, taking the picture in and it has so much more impact. I love digital, I, I've, I've been brought up on using digital but you cannot beat print, you really can't. No, I completely agree with you. Part, part of my, um, my business model as I move forward as a photographer is to make sure that my clients are getting something in their hands that they just don't get anymore. Yeah. Um, it's really important today because we are all digital. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree cool. more. Cool stuff. Shall I unshare my screen? Shall I come back to yeah, you guys? Please, yes. Let's, uh, I'm still dressed. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Click. Right. Can you guys see me now? 
Almost. Yeah, we yes. can. This hey. is this is the this is the one um, platform where, um, like Alan Shapiro would say, pants are optional. <laughs> yeah, you can only see me waist up. upwards, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to think of you guys sitting there. And <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pretty picture because it's cold over here. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's cold here too. <laughs> oh, it's really cold here. <laughs> Oh, you guys are funny. All right, well, look, I wish we could talk more because I know we would have real fun, but it's been so much fun already. And I'm telling you, Glenn, I'm in awe of you. I need to learn from you a lot. And, um, you know, at the end of every show, I think, and sometimes I say, that's the best show we've done. Out of all 51 shows, that's the best one. <laughs> but really, I'm thinking that's this the is best the best show. show. <laughs> I'll second that, and I've been on one. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, before we go, and we do have to go because I, you know, we don't want to like we want people to be able to go off and have their dinners and you know not get too sleepy and watch the whole show. So, um, anybody have anything else important to tell? Things you're doing, you, I don't know, things you've read, something. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly if you don't mind. It's just I mentioned it um, during the show. There, I've got a weekly podcast. Uh, and YouTube show that goes out every Wednesday. So that's just something for people to look at. It's completely free. Um, tips and tricks and techniques that I post every week. And also on, the, on my website, we've got uh, tutorials that people can download. And I think I'll probably send you a message with a, a code that people can get, I don't know, maybe 50% off or something like that as well. So That'd be cool. And where, how do you get the website and where do you get the podcast? It's, uh, uh, well, if you go to uh, glindewis.com, Everything's on there. So the YouTube channel, it's dead easy, youtube.com forward slash Glyn Jewish. But all the links are there. Uh, but if people prefer to um, watch it on their iPads and iPhones and download it, they can also go to the iTunes uh, podcast store as well. So you're really an institution unto yourself. <laughs> you're everywhere. <laughs> God well, you know, I'll, I'll just put in there before we, we sign up and say goodbye is, um, I've developed a, a certain proficiency in Photoshop. I wouldn't say that I'm as, as uh, nearly as advanced as anybody else in the room, but I've developed a proficiency. When, it, when you get to a certain level, it's you guys and, and you, Glenn, that I look to when I need to learn something to teach someone else. So um, I just wanted to put that out there, that you're, you're really a, a teacher of teachers. So I, uh, I thank you for what you do for us. Thank you. But the same, the same comes back, guys. I, you know, I looked at each and every single one of you, Every one of you, I, I'd known about you way before you'd known about me. So I've kind of <laughs> learned from you all the time. It's just because we're so old. <laughs> <laughs> he was like being hair. diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> all right then. Anything from you, Sean or Eugene, to add? No, I'm still amazed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna gonna be heading out and going on eBay looking for my Iron Man suit next, and. So. <laughs> That's what I'll be wearing next time. <laughs> you may need it in Iceland. I hear it's very, very bad weather there, right? Yeah, well, a little one, little one for the dog too. We'll, uh, we'll make the best of it. <laughs> yeah, and the dog, Iron Dog. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I just want to say, aside from the time zone difference, um, if if anyone's watching doesn't know this, this is what is it like, like three thirty in the morning for you, Glenn? Yeah, it's just, yeah, 25 past 3 in the morning. Yeah. So we want to oh have God. you back on the show, but maybe when you do the American tour, then you can come join us in a regular time. But you're welcome it, back anytime. I mean, if you seriously. think you can put up with me again, I'll be more than happy. And this is easy. I can always catch up on sleep. It's good fun. Okay. I'm, I'm wide awake. Right. We're happy to hear that because we'll definitely have you back. Cool. Thank you very much. And all of you, that, that goes for everybody down there. This is, you're all amazing. And thank you for coming. And everybody out there in Google Plus land and YouTube land, thank you for watching. And we'll see you in two weeks for another episode of the Photoshop Show. Yeah. Bye, guys. See you. <laughs>